you guys are the most important ones anyway, because you're newer. <laughs> okay. So there's all sorts of ways in which you have to go show property, but the one I wanted to teach you today is when it's like game on, you have two days with a customer from out of town and you have to be perfectly organized so that your day is smooth. And it's all about having a, a smooth day. Anything can go wrong when you have customers coming from out of town. So the better prepared you are, the better your day is going to go. And um, so you can take little bits and pieces of this for, you know, that random customer that you work with all the time and you happen to have a showing after work, no big deal. It's the ones that you're like, you have no second chance if you mess up. I've had, I think one of the worst ones I had was 20... I'm sorry, like 18 miles out of town. They wanted to meet me in their RV, their camper. They have tons of money, but they were looking at houses and they had no time to meet me beforehand. They wanted me to show up like super, like uber wealthy and meet in their little like travel, I guess not wealthy enough to have more than like a smaller RV. So I'm meeting them in it. Uh, what it yeah, it's called an RV. The, and they were in this little park thing, no cell service, no nothing. So I meet them and I tell them about our day and what we're going to do. And I'm introducing them the brokerage disclosure and all that. And they're like, they just decided on the spot that they only wanted to see land. So then I have to get back in the car, drive to work and set all these showings up and so now we're seeing land and houses and I'm already have like a schedule of when we were supposed to see everything which has gone out the window because now it's been an hour and a half since I was with them and I'm panicking it was terrible like but sometimes you can't do anything about it because the people are like I'm not available until you meet me but all the things we talked about like when you first meet with a buyer if you have a day or a schedule like that planned with people get all that stuff about the brokerage disclosure all that first meeting stuff, all the things you do with Ninja, like what are your goals? What are your aspirations? Get that out of the way over the phone. Be doing all that on a Zoom call or a Hangouts and try to get your customers ready because if you have them come into town, you've got to be game on and ready to go. So some obvious things. You have to have a clean car. You have to have it perfectly done. If you have to go and show, um, do something that like you leave work, you got to go show property that night and then you're meeting these people on Saturday morning, go clean your car again and get it like spotless because it is their first impression. And I have had people that are like, "Ewy," because I came, I lived on a dirt road and yes, some dust got on it, but like they opened the car door and they're kind of freaked out that there was dust. They had it like, oh, my trousers got dirty. So you have all sorts of people like that. Just, just make sure it's really clean, especially the first time you meet people. You want to be well dressed. You don't be showing up the first time you meet people in person where you're wearing jeans. Like, just don't do it. There's like khakis or lots of things you can wear as a guy or a girl that aren't like jeans. You know what I mean? So, if you know the people, it's totally different. But you want to be sensible and you want to be well dressed at the same time. So, however that is, and I know it's like 93 degrees out. So, just be sensible about the way you um, dress. But we're in Durango. A lot of people aren't from Durango. So you want to have, you aren't trying to be like the person that they're going to want to go out for a beer with later. I've had people that are like, oh, I showed up and I wasn't prepared. And, you know, the other agent was dressed up and I was like in my sandals and they really got along with me. And we like wanted to go out for a beer afterwards. I'm like, yeah, but they're not going to want to buy the million dollar house through you. So you just want to be like, what you're doing is you're not just saying, hey, I want to be cool and be friends with you. It's more about, I'm showing you that I know this is one of the most important decisions of your life. And I want to impress you because that's important to me. So be sensible, well-dressed, always have a pair of boots in the back of your car, always have a pair of boots in the back of your car. So if it's winter, winter boots, ladies, if you're wearing high heels, you bring some, you shove some tennis socks back there too. So even if it's upper end properties, you will have that person that's like, can we go walk the property? Oh, Colorado is so exciting. And you're like, I have stockings on. So I just would throw it in the back of my car and they were nice looking. They were just like something I could tromp in the mud. I have ruined so many nice pairs of shoes. I love high heels. And so I've had so many shoes ruined because I'm like, well, I don't want to show them that I'm afraid to go do that. So I'm out there like <laughs> walking up the property and you could twist your ankle, all that stuff. So have something in the back of your car that you can um, change and plug in your phone. 
and make sure you have a full charge and that you also bring your car charger if you need it because there are so many times that you're like trying to do these little apps to see what that property is worth and then you're trying to call the agent and you're out of range a little bit so it's sucking up your battery so don't fool around with not having your uh, car charged up also your e-key make sure it works before you get on the road so i don't know how it works with the app i used to live out of range so i never trusted those things that were like on my phone i wanted the hard one like we have in um, my room so that I could see that it was updated it was going to open a lockbox before I left the office or I could like make a phone call and make it work so don't fool around with that either everyone's done it where you've gotten somewhere and you're so far away from service and then it's not working and so then you got to kind of drive down the road until you get service and you're like trying to punch it in and meet the people back there and they just don't get our jobs they mostly understand but that's a thing too. Leah, did you have your hand up? Uh, well, I have a really quick question. I'm in the middle of trying to, and I don't want to interrupt new agent training for this. Sorry. I was on the phone with Todd and he wanted me to talk to you, but we have, I have a client trying to buy a lot and they've got another offer coming in and he doesn't want to lose it. <laughs> so I have, he wants to know because he has 160 cash and that's max. And this is a really interesting question for everybody. So he wants to know, but the lot was listed at 169. He wants to know if he can put in one offer for 160 cash and a separate offer for 170 with financing or his wife could do one and he could do one. Todd says he has never heard of anyone doing that and thinks no. it's completely flipping bizarre. That's bizarre. Um, but like, you know what I would do? He I was like, I don't know what to tell somebody, ask Heather. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to be at new agent training. Yeah, Sorry. okay, so um, you probably have to leave after this. So. I do. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Okay. Uh, um, so another thing you don't want to let go wrong. Sorry for that. That was it's still interesting. Um, that will probably never happen to you. Um, <clears throat> what I do is I'm an overthinker. I, you guys are going to be overthinkers too. Jeremy Christensen is another person in this office, total overthinker like I am. But it's because we've had all these things go wrong in our lives that we're like, how can we make this seamless so nothing's going to go wrong? You got to figure out what you're doing for lunch. <laughs> you will have people. I have two days and I'm buying a $900,000 house. So have your schedule cleared for me for three days and we're going to see property and figure out what you're doing for lunch. So whether it's I'm bringing a picnic lunch for us all, or I have the whole of the county perfectly arranged, we're going to go out to some people will, especially million dollar people, they're going to drag you to Mancus in the same day as Bayfield. They, 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 or two different days, but you got to figure out on a map what your situation is. I'm going to go out to Bayfield and then we're going to hit the resort. And in between, we're going to stop at this awesome bakery called Bread and I'm going to treat you to lunch. Does that make sense? So you're figuring out like, okay, if we meet at nine o'clock and we do those, on, then we'll be down here at 1130 and we, they always have sandwiches at 1130. So just figure out and like bathroom breaks, it's COVID. You're not allowed to use the bathroom. So figure all that stuff out with your day. Um, bring some mints, have some mints in your car. You're driving all day. You're talking all day. Make sure that's in your car. Um, if we ever got back to non COVID times, I always had like the Sirius XM and have the jazz or the classical, like have that all playing in the background. Cause you can have long periods of time. Let's say COVID is going to go away. It's not always going to be with us, but if you're driving with people for a long time, there's going to be big silences. So having a little music in the background eases some of the tension. So have that all figured out too. <clears throat> then. What I would do is I printed, never come into the office and say, I'm not meeting them until 10. So I'm going to print out all the MLS sheets as soon as I get to work. The printer's going to be broken. We're going to be out of toner. We're going to be out of something else. Don't stress. You have enough to stress about. Do it the day before. Get it all printed out. And then you want to organize your list. And when you're setting appointments, I set my appointments two days before I was going to show. I'm showing them on a Saturday morning. I'm going to set it up by 48 hours before that because they can't reach the tenant. Um, there's another showing that wanted to get in exactly the same time you wanted to get in. Any of those things, you want to be the one that gets to show it exactly when you want because you don't want to have to change your whole list. Like I have four properties in Forest Lakes. I have one over in Pine Springs and then we got to these other places we're going. Well, what if one of those Forest Lakes people is like, oh, we have a showing right then. No, we can't accommodate that. I have a doctor's appointment, whatever it is. So then you have to go all the way to Pine Springs and all the way back for that one showing. So two days ahead is the um, best time to do it. 
and it could be more. So I've learned this over the years. If you have people who are coming from out of town and they have their heart set on a certain property, oh God, I can't wait to see that house. And you call on Thursday because they're coming in on Saturday and you found out they just got an offer. Doesn't look good for your people. They are so stressed out about that because they called you six weeks ago. That property has been on the market for 300 days. Of course it just went under contract. And that's the reason they made their trip to Durango. So I might, with the buyer's permission, call the people a couple weeks before even and say, look, I have this person coming from out of town. I'm just letting you know. I have. They are totally sure. And you know how this works. It's probably not going to be your home they're in love with once they get here. But right now they say they really love it. Could you just let me know if you have something going on? Like you're going to pull it off the market or you're getting another offer. Not that they'd act but just so that I don't have to disappoint them because they're making their trip about seeing your home. So do it in a way that's not like, oh my God, seller, like we're going to make you an offer. You don't want to get their hopes up, but you want to alert them that you don't want to be let down the night before because there's, oh, there was nothing worse than making that call and just saying, I'm so sorry. I know you had this whole trip from Dallas to see this house and it really did just go under contract. Or the sellers just decided not to sell the house. And they're like, well, tell them we're interested. And like, well, they already made up their mind. Um, and then when I was a newer agent, Luis, you're probably not gonna have to do this, but when I was a newer agent, and Anna, this is totally you. If you don't know the subdivision, drive it the night before. Don't get lost with your customers. Shenandoah is a perfect example because you have two sides to the subdivision and you can't get through. There's like a gate somewhere in there and Google Maps doesn't know that. <laughs> so if you're Googling it, it's not gonna tell you. So you're Googling it, and I did this on drive, our, our, our tour last year, two years ago, that I took all the agents out. I'm like, oh yeah, there's a gate. So we had to like go from one house, go out and come back the other way. Don't make stupid mistakes like that. They're gonna just look at you like, what have you been in real estate for three months? And Anna, was, your answer would be like, actually it's been one, you know, like so. <laughs> to make it look like you know what you're doing. Um, I have gone to Los Ranchitos, to Forest Lakes, just to kind of get the lay of the land. But if nothing else, if, if, you're, if you're like, if it's a weird location and it says, oh, there's a number on it, then it's easier now. With Google Maps, like, it's really pretty easy to find places, but they still do make mistakes. So if you're scared about it, if you're like, I do not want to screw up. Like, remember Henry, a couple of weeks ago, he was saying, God, I had these people, I spent so much time and then they got to Durango, I spent all this time with them and then they just went with somebody else. You're going to make those mistakes and the best way you cannot have that happen to you is to just be perfect. There's no reason for them to say, I told you, honey, they're new and they just don't get it. Um, I also think, uh, just adding on to that, that uh -huh. one of the big deal breakers probably would have been that uh, they wanted to see property in Silverton and the Vicedo area. Well, you can't do anything about that. What are you going to do? Right. Well, I was planning, we were going to go to Silverton one day and then like Durango area another day. And I met with, they came into town that day. I met with them that night. And then the next day I was planning on showing them properties in Silverton and they wanted to see properties in Durango because the hotel wasn't open in Silverton or something like that. Got it. So I was totally prepared to go to Silverton and I didn't have the list of all the Durango properties on me. And, and, and there's nothing so. you can do. Like you're going to make, and it's not even a mistake. They had a problem. You couldn't accommodate because of life. Like that's the way it is. You had planned on a certain thing, but they can use that as an excuse against you. Like, Oh, I knew it. I just knew it. It wasn't going to work out that sort of thing. So, you know, and, and you're still going to lose people. You're still going to have people that you, like floor is a perfect example. If you build your business through the people, you know, you will be let down a lot less than it's people you don't know. But with Hosiah, Anna, Henry, with your age, you probably don't know like a hundred people who are ready to buy a $400,000 home. I know when I was 28, that's what the position I was in. So I had to grow my business from a ton of people I didn't know. And it's not that they, sometimes they assume you're getting paid anyway, like you're just getting a paycheck from Colo Banker. But a lot of times they just, they just don't care. They, they just don't, they're like, I just need my house. I'm sorry. I kind of messed up and, and this poor person had to drag me around, but I'm not going to think about that. And I'm just going to go on with my life. So um, if you have to build your business through people you don't know, it happens. And there are people that I have spent like weeks with, and then all of a sudden found out they put something under contract that had nothing to do with me. So 
Um, but like I'm saying, like the more perfect you can be, the less it'll happen. And then you'll just get to a point where you have confidence and you know the market really well, and then you're just not, it won't happen as often to you. So then, okay, here's another one. Drive the night before, home snap. So I have home snap. As a manager, I have home snap because I like to go on vacation and I'm driving by a house and there's a for sale sign and I push on it and it'll tell me what that house is for sale for. Cause I love it. I like, I'm in Moab or I'm at the Jersey shore. I'm like, I wonder what that house is selling for. And I could push a button and do it as a realtor. The, the, well, as a sales agent, the one time I used it, actually there were two times. Uh, one was because you're going to have people that you tell them, I want four bedrooms, two baths. No way. I'm not going to take a three bedroom. No way. Am I going over 400? And then you drive by a house and they go, well, what about that one? Why aren't you showing us that one? Is it because there's a Wells Group sign? Are you not wanting to sell, sell a Wells Group home? So they have all these like dialogues in their house or in their heads that say why you might have just skipped by that because they don't want to trust you. So if you have home snap, you can press on it and see what that house is um, for. I'm sure Zillow has an app like that. But another cool thing about home snap is um, when you're walking a property, you will have GIS um, like a GIS map with you, but let me see, there's a chat. Let me see if it's, oh, no problem. Um, you'll have the GIS map. Oh, cancel. I almost ended the meeting trying to close this. You'll have a GIS map with you that shows you where the property lines are. Let's say it's a jagged property, but when you're standing on a property in Forest Lakes, how do you know how close you are to the back? So it used to be with GIS, you'd be like, well, it looks like there's a dip here. So maybe that's that back corner. So look around, maybe you'll see a post here somewhere. Um, with HomeSnap, it will show where you're at on the map, the satellite image of the property. You would never use it to say, oh, this is where the property line is, but you use it as a gauge to say, it sure looks, look at my map here on my phone. You notice how we're getting really close to that back property line. So it's probably somewhere around here. So you're not telling, you're not relying on it, but it's so, so super helpful, especially when you're showing land. So home snap, definitely download that for your computer. Brokerage disclosure, okay, for a very long day, you're gonna wanna take care of all that stuff before you get in the car with them or in separate cars with them or get to the property. Just, if you have a long day, you don't wanna be talking about, it's, it's just another layer that you have to talk about the brokerage disclosure. You gotta talk about the buyer agency, try to have that conversation with the whole ninja stuff before you, um, before you get serious and you're out on showings. And then if you are only looking in one or two areas, if you have a person that says, I am in town and um, I'm moving my family down here, I'm doing the, the research, I'm here for two days and then my family's gonna come in once we have it under contract and look with us, if they're only, if they're, they're a serious buyer, everybody should be serious if they're getting in your, if they're going out with you. But if they're looking in Forest Lakes or Enchanted Forest, I'm going to use that as my example today, um, then do the comps for every single property you show. Okay. So let's say you're going to see six homes or seven homes, but they're all in the same subdivision and they're all sort of similar, right? They're three bedroom, two bath, whatever it is take the time and do the comparables for them so that they never feel like they can't make a decision. You wanna keep pushing the yes button for them so they can be like, oh yeah, okay. Well, what do you think I should offer? Well, what are the comps? Well, maybe I should do more research. Maybe I should wait. You say, oh no, I did some comps with you. These are the last six months of sales. So I drove by these last night. Oh, that's another idea. You can drive them by the comparables. So if you had them with you, you could drive them by and say, I wanted to point out, so I went to this house a couple months ago when it was on the market before it went under. And um, you notice how like, it looks nice from the street, but when you get close, the siding's kind of falling off in the back and the, the, the roof looks like it needs to be replaced. So it's really not the best comp, even though it looks good on paper. Um, so that's a, the kind of driving tour that would be super helpful to help people make a decision and, and push the yes button. And when you get back to normal, when things go back to a time when you would um, be able to have people in your car, Hosiah, Henry, you are going to be so awesome at this. I was not from Durango, so I got good over time. You are a tour guide. Act as if, like Hosiah, your, your uh, glacier experience, your experience up there is, is very similar. Um, my experience, like my husband's a raft guide. It's very similar. It's like you want to be 
I'm going to drive them all the way out to Forest Lakes and I am going to lose my voice by the time we are done for the day because I'm going to be telling them about, you know, these uh, terrace gardens and, and like the main thoroughfare. And when Florida Road was, that's our ski hill over there. Oh, we're going past Chapman. They have great programs for kids. And wait, you should see the, you should see the, uh, the older kids play hockey. They're one of the best ones in the state. And then you're driving further along. And you're like, so they, if you notice, there's bike lanes on either side of the road. They increase the road size and it's, it, the traffic flow is pretty good in the mornings. And oh, and the elementary school's over there. And you're taking them on a tour of the, of the county. And you're also telling stories that you know about what used to be there. Like as I'm driving by Helen's store, I'm like, oh yeah, so the owner there, this is some of the history there. And telling some crazy stories I knew from the owner, or, you know, anything you know as you're driving, it, they love it. They want to love our town. So you tell them anything that you can, and you're going to learn that stuff quickly, even if it's on tour, you're just going to learn stories that you can tell like, oh my gosh, yeah. They'll say, what about that subdivision up there? Like, oh, wait, it, wait till you see the road. There is no way you would purchase up there. It's super rough. Do you want to take a quick look? Oh yeah. So you kind of go up for 300 feet and they go, oh, I would never live up here. Okay, turn around, let's go. So you want to make them love where you live. And the fact that you guys grew up in Durango, the two of you will really um, help them like get to that point where they're going to, uh, they're going to love it like you and they're going to feel really honored to be with you. Wow, we found someone who's from Durango. So if you're not from here, like me, it's, I got here as fast as I could and oh, I just, I love Durango and here's some of the reasons that I love the town and I would never ever leave and I thought I'd never love any place more than Durango and so you're telling your story in that way um, and that's a good way to relate with them. So scratch paper. Now this is the, this is the heavy duty like what I bring on a showing. So I got, I was thinking about doing this online and I thought, no, I can do this this way. So you got one of these, always have one of these. And this is an easy, like I am out in the field showing land or I am in a million dollar home. This was what I wanted to have. So I had something to write on and I had all my papers in one place. Then I guess I took it off of here. I had three or more pieces of scrap paper. So you just have some scrap paper in the, behind everything. And then I put that in the back and you put that there and I had a pen that would be clipped on here. And that's so that you could do a scratch pad close. Maybe you're sitting in a house and you um, want to take extra notes because they, they say, oh, honey, this is the house. I think I want to buy it. And you're furiously scri uh, scribbling. Oh, they have a wine cooler. They have a refrigerator. They have a gas stove. You're trying to write things down so that when you're writing the offer, you can remember to say, um, at, at, they're walking through the house. They go, oh, I would buy this. But they better include the ATV, write down the ATV, like anything you need to know that you don't want to forget about the offer. I just write little notes. And sometimes it's helpful to do it even on the house you don't think they're going to make an offer on because that's the one they end up making an offer on. So I have the scratch pad paper and it's also like they say, oh, I wish I could have written down blah, blah, blah. You say, oh, here's a piece of paper for you. So then I have, what I did is I print out, so I will show you, oh, I didn't have this ready for you, but let's, I can do this with you on the phone on the online. So we're going to go to Paragon. Sorry, I wasn't even thinking of this. And when you do your MLS sheets, so I brought them with me. And I always use my house as an example because I can, it's the only one I can remember the address on. So you want to get your MLS reports dialed in. You find which view you like best. And for me, it's called All Fields Customizable. Some people like um, different reports that have bigger pictures. I never needed a bigger picture. Why do you need a bigger picture if you're just going to be sending them a link later? They're looking at the house, so you don't need the big picture. But for me, my favorite was All Fields Customizable. And I had this dialed in to have all the information you need. So it takes you 20, 25 minutes to set up. Where do you set it up? I guess it's in your preferences up here. Do the preference wizard, figure out exactly how you like it to look. Like every time you're on a showing and they go, well, how many square feet is the, what are the dimensions of the master bedroom? And you go, oh, I don't know. It's not on here. So then you remember like, okay, remember to set up your, whatever you have on you, that it has that on it. 
So I had certain things I put up here, like you can dial it in, like I like these things up here. I like these things down here. So you can set it up the way you want or just fly by the seat of your pants, you could. But here, see all these features? I wanted it to show the features and I wanted it to show what the taxes were and where they get their water and whether they have good internet service or internet service at all. And I wanted it to show the remarks in the addendum, right? But if you notice what's not on here, you don't have a uh, commission. I didn't have the owner's names. I didn't have um, anything that was confidential because you can't give that to the other party. You, under no circumstances, are you allowed to give a all field detail to a customer because some of that information is only for us. Um, anyway, so this is the field I would have. I would print it and I'd staple it and I'd make a copy for myself. So they get the fancy copy. That's the color copy, right? Um, and then I had an extra one of every single thing we were doing in black and white. And then I would print out the GIS map for each one. So when you do a GIS map, might as well, you got time. So I'm going to show you this. The plot of GIS, this one, hopefully this works. And I'm going to pick, anybody know an address in Forest Lakes off the top of your head? 289 Woodland Drive. Thank you. Perfect. That is a great example. Oh, Woodland. Hold on. So let's say this is the property. I would print this one out. And there's two ways of printing it. One has the parcel information and how much the assessor thinks it's worth, worth and one doesn't. It doesn't matter. You print whatever you want. I want it really big because this is the one I'm going to use when I'm out there because a lot of times you're out of cell service. So don't rely on being able to access your phone. Um, I want to be able to know when they say, oh, we're standing here. Do you think that I'm at the back of the property now? And you go, actually, you see how there's like trees right here, big trees, like uh, they look round. So we're standing in uh, the bushes. So I bet we're right here, but let's head back to here. Oh, I bet we're about here now. You're not telling them, oh, I know where the property line is. You're just saying, doesn't it look to you like it might be over there? So you're getting them to go, yeah. So it makes you like, you know what you're doing, not saying, I don't know. And then, but you're also not telling them, you know, something you don't. Okay, so I would print that out and then let's go back. Then I would also print out, sorry, I'm making you dizzy. I'd print this out and why do you think I would do that? I would have the, uh, yeah, the contours. I wanna print that out for them too because I wanna know how to get there. So yes, my phone's gonna tell me how to drive there, but I also want them to know, like when you hand it off at the end, that this is kind of where it's at. So I give them two maps and sometimes on the second map, it's cool because you can like put arrows to the ones that sold around it if you wanted to help them do C a CMA so that you're out there. You say, okay, there's like five other ones that sold in the last year. I, I made this little map for you and it shows you where, what else do you have to do when you're a new agent? Spend all the time in the world on these people. And yes, they will um, jerk you around sometimes, but at least you're totally prepared and you're learning about the market and maybe you're going to be an expert on a $15,000 lot or was it 5,000? Sorry, Henry, it was $5,000 lot in uh, Forest Lakes. And another cool thing about this view is it's going to show you, oh, there's some really cool BLM land right in the center of uh, Forest Lakes and you get there right here. So I'm going to print out both of those and I'm going to staple it to the nice copy I had. Okay. So then when I leave them for the day, I have a manila folder whoop, this way. I write the date that we went out. Like this is the Saturday folder. Here's the Sunday folder. And then it has every single MLS that, number that we went to. It has their signed brokerage disclosure in it or signed, I guess the, a copy of the brokerage disclosure if that's when you got them to sign it. I might have, oh, I always put my card every time they go out with me, they get a new card by me that's uh, stapled in there. So they have no problem finding my phone number. And then what I would do is I, you use whatever maps helpful to you, but you want a driving map of some sort that's fun. This is really a boring map, but it works. It's like the DAR map. I like it because it has three square miles in either way. So I know it's like 20 years old and it doesn't have like half the subdivisions on it, but you want some sort of thing you can hand someone at the end and say, this is where all the properties were. And then on the map, I would 
I would highlight one, two, three, four, so they could follow where we went that day. And then on all the sheets I gave them in the corner, it would say one, two, three, or four, so they could match it. Oh yeah, that was the house. Oh, it was out on the Mesa. Oh yeah, and then we went out to Forest Lakes. That was number two. Oh, that's the one that was 259,000. Okay, and then when you give it to them, oh, it's so much fun. They go back to the hotel, they go back to their Airbnb, and they can like look through all the documents. They get on Zillow, they're looking through everything. But that's how I had, you always wanna give things. Like I was just talking to Dave Fields this morning, and I know Anna, you talked to him this morning too. He said it's it's important when you're meeting people to give them gifts. And Ninja would say a free pen, a glass of water. But when I'm on showings, I always wanted to like leave them with a little gift of some sort. Sometimes the maps, like I made crazy maps for people in the two, three million dollar marks. They were like, could you explain your county for it for me? And I love art. So I'm there with my markers. I had this whole like it explained exactly where the mountains were and where the desert was and where the best views are. And I had like created this whole map and um, they got it and it would say, like I had little sticky tabs and it said, this is the airport and this is this. So yes, you can get a better one online, but it was something that they could take home with them and it just showed that you cared. So I hope that all makes sense to you. I'm gonna get out of here. Go uh, ahead, yeah. Uh, uh, a little bit nicer folders and they have a space for your uh that's little, it uh, yep for your, that's exactly uh, what i would do and i like that that's there they were not free for you mine yeah. are free um <laughs> and so i probably should have stepped up and had something nicer so yeah um the gis maps i'd use them while i was out on the showing and then i'd stick them in their file and then if you're ever if you have them in your car and let's say there's like 15 mls sheets if they weren't interested in the property I would just toss it in the back of my car so I could remember like, okay, they didn't like these five properties. They like these three. So um, it just helps you keep organized. And I know it sounds like a lot of paper, but when you're standing on a property, like your phone's gonna not work. <laughs> and HomeSnap might work, if, but, but trying to rely, like I'm sitting there and they go, well, what is that property? And they're standing there waiting for you. And you're, it's circling, like trying to get a connection and you're up at Perg standing there. So having the paper on you, there's just nothing like it. Um, and I think, you know, that really is it. Ask me questions all you want, but that's pretty much one I wanted to show you about a showing. Go ahead, you must have some questions. Stacy, you've even taken this class before. So when you are showing land and like you are looking, you're like, okay, I think this is a property line right here. If you look at these trees, um, to find out definitely, they just have to get a surveyor, right? Yeah, and, and yeah. it depends on the price range, you know. If you're looking at a $50,000 lot and it's gonna cost two grand for a good survey to really know where those boundaries are, um, people can get pretty creative. Um, Aspen Trails is a place, uh, Lake Purgatory is another place where you take the GIS map, you can tell where the, um, especially if you print out, you can print out a layer with the elevations. And so it'll show you like where all the ups and downs are. I can match, okay, there's a curve in the road like this, and I know we're looking at a curve in the road that way. And then you can kind of say, is there a place, oh, you can tell there's a survey across the street, like there's a survey marker and it tells you what lot that is. So you can kind of judge where you are by that. So there's ways to get around the survey to at least have them say, I know I want it. Like I know I'm not gonna spend 2,500 right now on a survey, but I at least know that wherever it is in this area, I could build a house and be happy. So that would be the only way you would get around having that expensive survey done. But yeah, it's also, um, you could just, you're going to get smart, but when you, you have to stare at the GIS and really, and maybe it's because I kind of, I, I had the science GI, like some of that is what I learned in school. But if you were up here, like Woodland Drive, I have never been up there, Henry, so please tell me if I'm wrong, but I bet it is really hard to figure out where stuff is. So maybe an agent has a sign here and you're trying to figure out what part of the property is that in. So you're calling the agent and you say, so do you think your signs, I'm judging that your sign is right at the beginning of the property because there's a curve in the road right there and that's what it looks like. And they go, yep, yep, that's what I thought too. So you at least have more guidance that that's it. And you might see this property right there, like you see a post there. So then you cross the street and you go, okay, I bet it's about this many feet or so. So you're just trying to judge, but you also, electric boxes super help 
electric boxes might have the address on it. If, if you see every electric box lined up, like in a newer subdivision, they're often lined up right at a property line and you see a telephone pole right there and you see the telephone, let's say it's this. And if you're really zoomed in, there's no electric up here, I bet. But you might be able to see on GIS that there's an electric, like uh, what do you call it, a power pole right there. And GIS is wrong. You never want to rely on it. But you know that it's probably somewhere around that property line. And you, you never say, hey, look where we are. You say, hey, buyer, I think this is pretty much what it's showing in the map. Is that what you see? And they go, yeah, I think that's right. So you're getting them to say, I think that's right. So you can sometimes tell just by like power poles and, um, and other survey lines. But yeah, you have to have a survey to tell. I will also say that just because there's a fence there does not mean that's the property line. It's absolutely true. So fences are very often not on a property line. And we have a couple boundary disputes going on in here right now where they're trying to figure out what to do before closing where it was found out during the under contract pro process, the fence was not on the property line. And so they want to have the neighbor just say, yes, we get it, our fence is on your property. And if we ever were to move it, uh, replace it, we would have to move it onto where the property line is. So yeah, boundary disputes are a real thing, Henry. I'm sure you've heard many stories over the years. Yeah, so um, I got my clients involved with finding the property lines. Yes. And it's kind of like fun. Like, like yes, it's fun. Like, like it was kind of fun to like walk around and be like, okay, like what do you think? Like, I think this yeah. is this under right now. And like it was kind of fun to actually like get them involved with it. And like they Absolutely. had fun. Absolutely. You try to make it, it fun for them. And you might have out of a couple, there's the one that really wants to like, even if it's a house, they really want to go in the back and they really want to figure out, okay whoa, I'm from the city. Like, how big is three acres? Let's go. And you just kind of walk back there and like, I think it's back there, but there's a fence, but it might not be on the right fence. There's probably two fences. And, you know, you just send them back there, go check it out. And then they come back 15 minutes later, like, I'm buying a property in Colorado. So you try to make as much of it fun as possible and, and keep people entertained, bring treats, just bring water, bring everything they might need, warn your customers to bring some um, you always warn your customers to dress sensibly too. Like if it's really hot out or if it's really cold out, people from Arizona don't know to bring uh, boots and they might get there and they really want to walk the property, but they don't have, I've brought like up at Curd, we used to have, um, uh, I bought uh, snowshoes for the office uh, by the agent's request that like we need snowshoes. So when we have to go show a property, we can just grab them and go and have some for our customers. So if you have any of those things, shove them in the back of your car. Like I used to, um, walk a little trail for people in the snow and then they could kind of walk where I was walking so be prepared and let them know what they need and like say hey I think we might get a thunderstorm in the afternoon it might get really cold so make sure you bring a jacket if you're out there all day just want people to be comfortable bug spray always have bug spray either I don't know if that stuff lasts in your car you want that here's some things you need bug spray suntan lotion absolutely have that for you and have it for your customers too i always kept some in my office i think i still have some in here um and what else do you need in your car wd-40 if you're showing uh locked properties or they have like a gate then sometimes those locks need a little bit of wd-40 in the lock and you can open it uh what else i think that's that's pretty much it i mean obviously you have a hammer for your signs, I would bring that too. And if I, even if it's an agent from Keller Williams or whatever, and their signs falling over on the way out, I love to let my customer see that I was fixing the other person's sign. Just be kind. You don't want them to have to drive 15 miles to fix their sign, right? So uh, I do that for them and be like, hey, so and so, I let you know your sign was knocked over. I went and fixed it for you. So you have those things in your car when you're when you're out there. Do you guys think of other questions? Yeah. So how do you like? not like hover too hard, but also, cause you're supposed to stay with your, with the buyers, but if it's somebody's home, like what if they like split up, you know, what do you do? You don't want them to split up. And actually you can't, with COVID it's really easy. Um, you can just say, hey, uh, with the rules the way they are now, I have to walk by you and uh, disinfect anything you happen to touch. So we have to stay together when we're going through things. So that's the perfect way to say it to people in the future when things get back to normal that's impossible um, but if you had kids with them you have to be more wary about what the kids are doing so they're not breaking anything okay so that would be your first concern like don't let the kids break anything 
Secondly is you don't want them stealing prescription drugs or any of those things. You forewarn all of your buyers before you get in the car. If anybody doesn't know forewarn, just ask me later. Um, so you know if they're a problem, but if they split up, you're just lost. You try to keep your eye on where someone's going. And if anything is like a red flag, like I hear something rummaging, I'm gonna go up and be with that person. But what I do is um, you never, if you're a new agent, you're nervous. So you're gonna be like, this is the bedroom. This is the kitchen. Like, just keep your mouth shut. Just be quiet. You don't have to talk. Let them enjoy. So you let them go in first. Never, ever let somebody go in behind you. You stay behind them. It's a safety precaution. You don't get stuck in a room. I don't care if you're a guy or a girl. Um, it doesn't matter. But if they go into a bedroom, I stay just close enough that I can keep my eye on them and I don't have to watch them. I don't have to like look at them. I want to, like, I, I don't know, I think everybody has the kind of peripheral vision that you can kind of just see what their body is doing. And I'm just like standing in the hallway and not in that room. However, if they went into the master bathroom, I would then go into the master bedroom and stay as far away as I could just so that I, unless you had bad ears, I think that's fine. I'm like listening and just using my senses to make sure they're not doing anything weird. But with COVID, it's going to be so easy because that's the only thing that's easy with COVID is you could make people stay together. So yeah, it's the same with open houses, especially when you get back to open houses. You don't want people to think that you're like following them because you want to work with them. You're like, no, it's just like, you know, so you just kind of, they go up to the second level and you just dilly dally. And then you slowly walk up the second level. And as you are, you don't, you're going really slow and you say, hey, just let me know if you have any questions. And then they walk slowly down the stairs. So you just trail them and don't be right on their tail. It's hard when you're new because you're, if you're like me, you're excitable and you're like, I got to show it. I have an open house. <laughs> There's somebody here. <laughs> and then you could always say, um, maybe you notice something that they might not notice, like a special drawer. Like, Luis, you would know this stuff really well and be able to do that really well being in construction, um, that you notice they had a special upgrade. And so you wait for them to go through that room. And as they're leaving, you say, hey, just in case, I, I just noticed this. I want to make sure you notice, like, you see that round edge there? That's a really nice touch um, or, or just something you wanted to see. They really did a good job. Like, I know that doing this is extra money. Or you're walking around the exterior and, and you notice, like, a certain, they, they put on a drip system or they, uh, what is it called? Like, an ice melting system. Or I know you're from Arizona, but that's an ice, that little cord right there, that's a hookup for an ice melting system. We should make sure that it works, but that's a nice touch because now you don't have to worry about ice dams. That's a really big cause of uh, roofs to leak in Colorado. And oh, oh, so any of those kind of things you can do. That's a way you can also make it look like there's a reason for you to be following them. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Anything else? No, uh, yeah, um, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. There's a good app. It's called Onyx Maps Hunt. Could you when stop you, that? What's that? Onyx on x maps hunt oh. and when you're when, when you have wi-fi it shows you by gps it, sh it shows you who, who owns the property and where you're at on the property so that's very similar to home snap i didn't know about that because that looks more like gis i like that because it it looks to me like it's showing you where the trees are and everything cool it is home very snap similar is to uh, uh gis but when you don't have service what you do is you save offline maps. So when you get up there, you can use it. You know what, I, the thing I like about that idea is it would save you from having to print anything out. Exactly, yep. yeah. Yeah, um, I like that. That would probably be a way that I would, I would probably stop using paper for the GIS if I had that. Because then- But you, it's not free. Oh, how much does it cost? I don't know, I think it's like $39 a year. Oh, that's not too bad. Yeah, that's not too bad. So do the cheap one would be GIS and using um, HomeSnap and then Onyx is cool. I did not know about that. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm, do you mind if I pitch that in the office meeting too? I'd never heard of that. Absolutely. That's cool. Okay, and then off, off. Okay, thank you. Um, what do they call offline maps you can save? 
Anything else people can think of? Questions? Things that are I was of? also thinking uh, another thing if you're showing properties probably up in the higher elevations maybe bring a can of that oxygen with you because I had a buddy yeah. that was up north of Silverton that saw a dude on a dirt bike collapse and his lips wow. were turning all blue and stuff you know to bring him back down to the hospital so wow. that might be <laughs> worth a couple dollars to just keep it around yeah henry i um you've named the one thing that didn't happen to me on a showing <laughs> <laughs> but i will say so it took me eight months to make my first sale like i was only 28 i didn't know many people in town and eight months but the closest i got was a house in forest lakes it was a poor call it was like a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house which at the time was like a really big deal to me and um i showed them property for like three days and they totally disappeared and I was so sad. I like wanted to cry. I'm like, what did I do? Did I smell? And they called me weeks later and said that he found out he ended up in the ER the second night because just what you said, he had a, um, he found out he had some rare like blood disease and that it was an oxygen related thing with our elevation and that he never could have lived in Durango. But I was like, well, thanks for at least letting me know this <laughs> night what I smelled. <laughs> so, so yeah, a can of oxygen. I wonder if you could keep that in the back of your car. Do you know if you could get that hot or cold or if it has to be like? I have no idea, huh. but I know it feels like it weighs almost nothing when you pick it up. So I don't know. Well, hey, it's kind of like a, a, you get a can of oil or a, what's it called? Air for your tires. If you're a biker, <laughs> carry a can of, <laughs> of air just in case your Texas buyer collapses outside. <laughs> now with how hot it is too. I mean, make sure you have lots of water. I, fix, I, fix a flat. And, and <laughs> that's what our fridge is for. <laughs> But take, take six waters. I used to keep um, I used to keep a, a case of water. It, it goes bad. It actually has expiration dates, so don't like give someone something that's expired. But I get a case. I leave it in the backpack where we have the signs, and then I put like and I have my um, a sticker on it, like my sticker, which is just my return label. Um, I put that on it, and I always keep like four of them in the fridge here. It's fine if you do that, and then uh, you always have cold water for people. So when you're hitting the road even if they're not in your car, bring a couple with you and just say, hey, I brought you some cold water because we're going to be out here for a while. And it's, there's nothing better than when you have a uh, buyer that actually buys you treats. They show up in the morning with a whole bag of like bread goodies and they're like, this is for you. Thank you for taking us out. Like, you don't have to thank me if you actually buy something for me. I will be happy. So any other questions you can think of? Otherwise, let's uh, 